part of the framing of this book and part of the way that that trauma unfolds is you talking about your family and, and your parents and your grandparents, but also talking about what's happening in your own immediate family and the end of a marriage. Tell me a little bit, I mean, as, as much as you're willing to say um, about what was going on in your own life as you were doing this work. Yeah, so my marriage was ending and I was in a, a very bad state and I started, you know, as one does, I thought I'll read about the Holocaust, you know, as things are already awful in my life. But I was seeking, um, I was seeking a number of things. I was, I missed my parents. Like I really missed having someone there someone who could wrap their arms around me and say everything's going to be okay I didn't have that so in the absence of that I thought maybe I'll just try and learn as much as I can about what their lives were like and and keep them alive in my day-to-day -day by reading about this and doing this research so there was that there was also this weird perspective like okay things are bad you're you're marriage is ending but hey it's it's not the holocaust it's not auschwitz um which is i know that sounds crazy to you but i've heard other people who are like me other two g's have that sort of way of thinking and then the third thing was these studies were coming out at that time and i wondered was i having a harder time getting over this because of what happened to my parents or worse did I cause this because I was so messed up by what had happened to my parents what do you mean did you cause it I mean you jokingly but not jokingly but jokingly sort of say in the book had Hitler ruined my marriage what, what do you mean had, had you caused this well like I say you know my mother was suspicious I'm suspicious I'm anxious I'm always you know I'm I'm a huge pessimist I'm very skeptical I'm cynical I'm like that doesn't sound like a really fun person to live with does it um, so I wondered if I was you know from the get-go ruined by what had happened to my parents and that made me an impossible person to live with do you worry about when you talk about that idea of intergenerational trauma and inherited trauma do you worry about the effect that this might have on your son all the time i am so worried about that and you know how how could i stop it i i don't know but one of the things that has come very um become very clear to me through this whole process of really thinking deeply about it is that if i inherited the trauma that my parents experienced or you know of some of it of, to a very small to a very small extent then i also inherited other things i inherited their resilience because they you know, through luck and circumstance and their actions and, you know, a whole bunch of things that the universe threw together, they survived this horror when most people did not. So there is some strength of character in them from having accomplished that. I'm not saying that the people who didn't survive weren't strong. I mean, it was just, as I say, it was luck and circumstance, but they, Beyond that, they built lives again. They they got married, they had kids, they moved to a, a country where they didn't speak the language, they bought a house, they got jobs, they started again. And that is such evidence of great resilience. And I hope that along with anything else I've inherited from them and that my son has inherited from me, that we have inherited some of that resilience. There's a lot of the book that's really funny as well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> it is a, it's not to make it sound like it's all, it, there's a lot of heaviness too, but there are moments of, of the, where you just laugh out loud as you read it. Yeah, it's, it's not a comedy. You're not gonna find it in the humor section of, of your local bookstore, but I, you know, I think the book is very much a reflection of who I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm neurotic and sad and angry and you know curious, but I'm also funny. So I, I think the book is those things too. It's like 
a pure reflection of, of who I am. It's not that I'm making light of the Holocaust in any way, of course not, but it is using humor as a lens at times. Like it's it's a respite for me. It always has been, and and it has been for my people. Like there's been a lot of persecution in in the history of the Jews, and we're all so pretty funny, some of us. Marcia, it's great to talk to you. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Matt. Marcia Liedemann's book, Kiss the Red Stairs, The Holocaust Once Removed, comes out tomorrow. That is the current for this Monday. Coming up next on CBC Radio 1, it's Q. Before we go, we wanted to acknowledge the death of someone who had a role in shaping some of the things you hear today on your CBC Radio. Andrew Simon was a longtime producer at the CBC. Andrew Simon was also the father of longtime producer on The Current, Kathy Simon, and he died last week. He lived an extraordinary life. This is just one paragraph from his obituary. I wanted to read this to you. Andrew survived the Holocaust thanks to a series of miraculous events, including finding shelter in Swiss diplomat Karl Lutz's glass house with his parents. They immigrated to Canada after a daring escape from Hungary in 1950. He embraced life in Canada, the best country in the world, and took great pride in his career with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Starting as a tour guide, he went on to report, produce, and manage. On assignment, he impersonated singer Tom Jones and was nearly ripped apart by crazed fans. He nearly enticed Leonard Cohen to host a news program rather than pursue his artistic aspirations. He produced interviews with an incredible range of people, from Hugh Hefner to Indira Gandhi. He created Canada's first open-line radio program, Cross Country Checkup. Under his leadership, CBC TV Calgary catapulted to number one in the market. He was head of Radio Canada International. His family knew to be quiet during newscasts and the National Research Time Signal. Our condolences to friends and colleagues, including our friend and colleague Kathy Simon and Andrew Simon's friends and family. Andrew Simon died last week. What a legacy. I'm Matt Galloway. Thanks for listening to The Current, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. This is CBC Radio 1, 89.1 FM in Waterloo Region. Alameen Mood. Every week I'm joined by writers Emil Niazi and Kevin Fallon to unpack the hot gossip and biggest culture stories of the week. There is just way too much content to contend with, so let us help you stay on top of culture news and prioritize those essential reads and watches. Come for the insight, and I promise you'll want to stay for the laughs. Pop Chat, Friday afternoon at 1, 1.30 in Newfoundland, and on the CBC Listen app. The CBC News is next, followed by Q. Before Terry Crews starred in Brooklyn Nine-Nine or hosted America's Got Talent, he was a football player in the NFL. And Terry will tell you why football was nothing but a ticket out of his hometown and a difficult home life, because a life in the arts was always his dream. From CBC News, it's the world this hour. I'm Joe Cummings. We start with the war in Ukraine, and as Russia's stepped-up campaign in the East continues, so too does the investigation into possible war crimes in the city of Bucha. Ellen Morrow has the latest. We were at a cemetery just outside of Bucha, and there were war crimes investigators from Ukraine's prosecutor general office on site, along with French police who are helping with the war crimes investigation here. And we were told by the prosecutor general's office that they were preparing to exhume the body of a woman who had been shot and buried by Russians, according to the investigators. In the end, a last minute decision was made not to do the exhumation at the wish, we're told, of the woman's family, but it does give you a sense of the ongoing efforts here to document the horrors that happened to so many people in Bucha. I was speaking to an advisor at the Bucha mayor's office. She told me that 416 bodies have been so far recovered here, and they know that number could continue to grow. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Bucha. As air travel ramps up again across Canada, travelers are being warned to expect longer than usual airport lineups and pre-boarding waits. 
So here now from Yvette Brand, we're being told there's no immediate end in sight to the delays. A lack of staff checking people through security is causing delays. Passengers flying out of Vancouver are urged to arrive two to three hours early. It's as frustrating for us as uh, the airport uh, as it is for passengers. Mike McNanny is Chief External Affairs Officer at YVR. He's never seen security screening take this long in Vancouver. Staff shortages are also causing delays in Montreal and Toronto. The Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, or CATSA, told CBC it's making every effort to fix the problem but can't find enough workers and when they do it takes time to train them 40 minutes, 40 minutes, yeah. Now we're traveling domestic, but we had to start off in the international gate. And Vancouver airport authorities say the long snaking lines may continue all summer. Evette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. Incidentally, as of today, tourists from 60 countries, including Canada, are once again welcome in New Zealand. It's a choir and performance troupe greeting visitors at the Auckland airport. Due to the pandemic, the country has been pretty much closed to travelers for two years as the government imposed some of the world's toughest COVID-19 border restrictions. Back here in Canada, Conservative Party officials have confirmed the final list of candidates running for the party's leadership. And one candidate who expected to be on that list has been rejected. Janice McGregor explains. Joël Etienne tried to submit all his money, signatures and paperwork by last Friday, but in a statement to Radio Canada, the Toronto Lawyers Campaign Team says they learned yesterday he's been rejected and the party won't provide them with information to justify this decision.